Coming up, the science behind vaccines. The nation's top health agencies clear the way for millions of kids ages 5 to 11 to get vaccinated against the coronavirus. Just how will these vaccines work? We've got everything you need to know. Also had the holiday season is already underway. What you and your family should think about before you make that list and check it twice. Then hot, hot, hot. Just what are volcanoes and why do they erupt? We'll go down below the surface and explain. Then animal cams, why there's such a big draw. Plus meet Biscuit, he's a little guy with a big mission and the newest member of the Washington Capitals hockey team. And crayon activists will introduce you to this 10 year old who turned her love of coloring into a project with a very important message. You can do anything you set your mind to and if you have a problem, it's not just gonna go away, you actually have to do something about it. Her inspiring story coming up. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt, and it's always great to be with you guys. I hope you all are enjoying the fall and having some fun. We've got a really terrific lineup from volcanoes to animal camps to this little guy named Biscuit who is training to serve veterans. Plus, it's time to turn those clocks back. We'll explain why we have daylight saving time. And a little later on, we can't wait for you to meet this 10-year-old activist. But let's begin with one of the top stories we've been following this week, and that's the pandemic and the road to recovery. There's been a lot of talk the last several months about vaccines, both for adults and kids. And it got us thinking, what exactly is the science behind vaccines and how do they work? Our pal, Dr. John, has the very latest. My question is, I have a question for you. It's been one of the biggest questions on your minds this year. When will the seven-year-olds get their vaccine? When will kids be able to safely get the vaccine? And after a long wait, it's finally here. A COVID-19 vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. I've been waiting for this a long, long time, and I'm just happy. Is the adult vaccine and the kids vaccine both the same? The vaccine for kids and adults is the same, but kids will get a smaller dose. That's because children's immune systems are a little different than adults. And even though it's a smaller dose, it still works really well. In fact, the study showed it was about 91% effective at stopping kids from getting sick with COVID. My question is, how do vaccines work? A vaccine works by tricking your body into developing antibodies against the coronavirus. Remember, antibodies are those soldiers that attack viruses. Normally, your body waits to create antibodies until the virus gets inside. That gives the virus time to make you sick. But the vaccine helps your immune system make an army of antibodies without having to see the coronavirus. That way, if the coronavirus does get in, the antibodies recognize it right away and can fight it off quickly before you get sick. When little kids are eligible to get the vaccine, do they need one dose or two doses? For this vaccine, kids ages 5 to 11 will need two doses, and they'll need to get them three weeks apart. And reminder, it takes the vaccine about two weeks to work after your second dose. That's when you're considered fully vaccinated. When the shot for, for kids come out, um, what is the side effects for the things that you could get in the shot? Kids may experience side effects like a sore arm, fatigue, or a headache, but these should only last for a few days. I'm not scared, but I'm not excited because I don't, um, because I, I don't want it to hurt. It was just a sharp pain, <laughs> and then it, and then it started feeling better. It may hurt a little, like a little pinch on your shoulder, and some of you may even be a little afraid of needles. But here's a secret, I'm afraid of needles too. But I've got some tips for you that helped me when I got my COVID vaccine. First, don't look at the needle when you're getting the shot, look somewhere else. And you can bring a stress ball or something you can squeeze or play with in your other hand. That way you're distracted. But my favorite is bring your parent, a sibling, or a friend along to talk with. That way you can tell jokes, you can trade stories, and you won't be thinking about getting the shot. But remember, vaccinations happen so fast, it'll be over before you know it. Dr. John Torres, thank you as always. So let's turn now to another story in the headlines, and that is the economy. The holiday season is just a few weeks away, 
And you may have been hearing about something called inflation lately. What exactly is it and how could it affect you and your family traditions? Our friend Stephanie Rule is here to help us understand. Hey there, Lester. I'm here with my daughter, Drew. And with the holidays just around the corner, parents and gift givers are seeing higher prices on just about everything. And with Christmas and Hanukkah and other winter holidays coming up, you might have already written your wish list. But this year, toys, clothes, and even decorations will be more expensive. And that's because of inflation. Inflation is a grown-up word for when things cost more in a short period of time. So what's causing it? Inflation is caused by supply and demand issues. So if a lot of people want one item, like a Christmas tree, and there's not enough to go around, that can cause the price to go up. So what does that mean for the holidays? Well, it means it costs more to make the presents, which means your parents are going to spend more for each item on your wish list, which means they're going to be paying a lot more of these holidays. What about decorations? Well, because so many decorations are made in other countries, there can be traffic jams getting them here. Plus, ships, trucks, and gas, they cost more too, which means the price of our favorite decorations could be going up. Last year, there were a lot of shipping delays. Could that happen again? Well, it's already happening between factories and stores. So if you want to get your gifts on time, better start shopping soon. And lucky for you, naughty girl, coal is more expensive this year too. So you might not end up with any in your stocking. You might actually get a present or two. Presents? Right on. Back to you, Lester. All right, Stephanie, thanks very much. Well, at exactly 2 a.m. Sunday morning, daylight saving time will end. This means clocks will move back an hour tomorrow and could affect your sleep. So did you ever wonder where we have daylight saving time? Our pal Dave Price explains. Hi, Lester. Hi, kids. I'm just checking all the clocks because early tomorrow morning at 2 a.m., daylight saving time officially ends when we turn the clocks back one hour and return to standard time. So essentially, we fall back. But why? Well, there are a few theories on how daylight saving time, saving time, singular, how it all began. Germany started observing it back in 1916 as a way to reduce energy costs during the First World War. Now, the United States officially adopted it in 1966 following the passage of the Uniform Time Act as a way to conserve energy. Now think about it. If it's light out longer, there's more daylight, and you'll need to light up your house at night for less time. And the farmers like this plan too. Now Hawaii and Arizona are the only two states that do not observe daylight saving time, but some 70 countries around the world do observe it as well. The beginning and the end dates vary from nation to nation, so just keep that in mind if you're ever traveling around the world. So when we turn the clocks back an hour, in theory, we're gonna gain an hour of sleep, but it also means less time to play outside in the daylight. Daylight saving time will return at precisely 2 a.m. Sunday, March 13th, 2022, when we will spring forward and then lose an hour of sleep. But the good news is most phones and computers automatically adjust the time, but manual clocks they're gonna to need to be adjusted. So if you have one of those, don't forget, turn your clocks back one hour before you go to sleep tonight. And then you'll wake up and it'll be the right time. So Lester, get some sleep and I'll see you soon. Back to you. Dave, thanks very much. Now let's switch gears and talk about a hot topic, volcanoes. There are hundreds of volcanoes around the world, including some right here in the United States, like in Hawaii and Alaska. But what exactly are volcanoes, and why do they erupt? Our friend Molly Hunter takes a closer look. With their rivers of lava, clouds of smoke, and powerful explosions, these aren't just regular mountains, these are volcanoes. There are about 1,500 volcanoes on Earth and even more on the ocean's floor. In fact, more than 80% of the Earth's surface is volcanic. But what are volcanoes and why do they erupt? Way down below the surface of the Earth at the outer core, things get really hot, as hot as the surface of the sun. The heat is so powerful, it can melt rocks, turning them into basically rock soup. This is called magma, and because the magma weighs less than the rocks above it, it wants to rise to the top. 
These are called tectonic plates. They're always moving and shifting, often in earthquakes that we can feel, and sometimes they create cracks for the magma. When the magma reaches the surface of the Earth and spills out of it, it becomes lava. Lava can reach a temperature of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and get this, that's about 10 times hotter than actual boiling soup. About 75% of the Earth's volcanoes are around the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire spans almost 25,000 miles, from New Zealand all the way to the coast of South America, around the Pacific Ocean, an area where most tectonic plates meet. To find out more, we caught up with volcano expert Chiara Petrone, and she brought some clues in rock form that help us understand what's going on. This is a pumice, and this is from the eruption at Popocatépetl, 14,000 years old. This is 14,000 years old. So obviously, we don't have pictures of that volcano. We don't have video of that volcano, but you know what kind of eruption yes, because, because of the rock. We can look at any rock and interrogate the uh, rock records. You can interrogate the rock record. You can find the DNA yes, of that rock. More or less, yes. But they're also important, Kiara says. They provide fertile soil, and she explains our cell phones and computers are actually made up of vital minerals from volcanic eruptions. And if the volcano stop, this means that our the Earth engine is not working any longer and our planet is going to die. <laughs> Volcanoes may be mighty and scary, and they are, of course, dangerous when they erupt, but they're also essential. They regulate heat coming from deep inside the Earth. And when the eruption stops and the lava cools down, it turns to rock, creating new landscapes way up here where we are on the Earth's surface. Molly, thanks so much. Great information. Time now for our pop quiz, where we put you to the test. The subject today is geography. And the question is, which country is the largest island in the world? The answer coming up after the break. Just ahead, animal cams, why we are so fascinated by them. We'll take a look. Plus, meet Biscuit, the newest member of the Washington Capitals hockey team who is training for a really important mission. And then we'll introduce you to this 10-year-old from Virginia who calls herself the world's first crayon activist. Her inspiring message for kids just ahead. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. Let's get the answer to our pop quiz now. The question, which country is the largest island in the world? The answer, Greenland. Greenland was a Danish colony until 1953 when it was redefined as a district of Denmark. The country has its own government and some 56,000 people live in Greenland, mostly around the coastal areas, since a good chunk of Greenland is covered in ice and snow. And in case you're wondering, Greenland is three times the size of Texas, so it's pretty big. Well, Veterans Day is November 11th, and the holiday is a time for us to honor our veterans of all wars. And there's one little guy in Washington, D.C., who is training for a big mission to help veterans. His name is Biscuit, and he's got game. Our pal Kevin Tibbles now with a story. There's a new teammate on the NHL's Washington Capitals bench. He's just a little guy. In fact, he only weighs 30 pounds. But three-month-old Biscuit is a real winner. Just ask Caps right winger Garnet Hathaway. Yeah, Biscuit as a new teammate is amazing. Um, and just whenever you enter the room and you see him, there's a smile on your face immediately. Biscuit, named after a hockey puck, is in training too to become a service dog helping military service veterans in need. Good boy. The Capitals teamed up with the charity America's Vet Dogs to help publicize the organization's work matching vets with four-legged friends. Dogs can help humans who are hurting. So our dogs are, you know, have outstanding training. You know, they work with individuals who have visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. So you know, whether somebody's missing a limb or has PTSD, you know, our dogs have special training for that. The organization pairs about 100 dogs annually with veterans, some who suffer from PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, a mental health condition that's triggered by a traumatic event. Dina Stone is a puppy raiser. She's sort of like Biscuit's teacher and babysitter all in one, until he's old enough to be fully trained. What do those eyes do for people who need assistance? 
I think those who need assistance look into the eyes of, of their dog and I just think they can easily put them at ease. And maybe if they're having a bit of a tough moment, that dog really looking at them and connecting with them, they understand that's what it's all about. And I, I do believe that the, the heart rate, the blood pressure probably all lowers just a little bit. Whoa. Biscuit is the second dog the Washington hockey team has supported. The first was named Captain. I think I am the luckiest person alive. And Captain now helps Marine Mark Wathney overcome the many traumas that followed him home from the battlefield. A dog will always give you unconditional love regardless of anything that you've done. They won't judge you. Dog's not gonna ask you any questions. No, it'll just give you the undying love. And believe me, when Biscuit is surrounded by kids, in this case, the children of Capitals players, there's more than enough love to go around. I think he's really, really funny. You think Biscuit's really funny? So let's wish Biscuit and the Capitals the best of luck. Training together to win the Stanley Cup and lend a veteran a helping hand or paw. It's an all-star lineup. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Washington. Kevin, thanks so much. Biscuit is definitely an all-star and an absolute cutie. Well, speaking of cute, animal cams at zoos across the country have captured our hearts this past year, from pandas to koalas and beyond. Our friend Carrie Sanders takes a look. Lester, it's one thing to see a picture of an animal in a book, but what about watching them living their lives? Perhaps the most popular camera in the world is the panda cam. Pandas are clearly the star attraction at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Worldwide, folks tune in to watch moments like this, a panda in a tree, and then, just like a kid who miscalculates the climb, wait for it, boom. Unpredictable, unexpected, and fun, because what just happened, happened live on one of the zoo's 41 panda cams, streamed to the internet for anyone to watch. Even if I'm not around the cams, if I'm, say, standing in the back area cleaning or something and I see something fun like that happening, I will run to the cam room so that I can make sure the cams are aimed um, not only for me, but I want the public to be able to see those things as well. An estimated 2 million people visit the National Zoo and the pandas every year. But on an average day, 90,000 more show up via the internet, clicking in sometimes for hours to watch the pandas and their engaging antics. When Xiao Shi Ji was born, they like to say that moment broke the internet. Sue Follis was watching that day. Since Xiao Shi Ji was born, Sue had only ever seen him online. So excited, Sue jumped into her car and drove all the way from North Carolina to finally see the one-year-old bundle of black and white bareness. This is your first time seeing in person? Yes. Everything else has been online? Yes. But you are kind of like a mama bear, it sounds like. <laughs> There are animal cameras streaming all over the internet. One popular site, Koala Cam at the San Diego Zoo. They can be slow moving, but still, what a joy to watch. You see a koala. Ava and Grace McDermott tune in to watch animals online. Time well spent. We see elephant. 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 That's so cool. Eagle Cam in Miami is not at the zoo. It's in the wild, where the unfiltered moments of life unfold in real time. I would encourage kids to sit there, watch it, and be patient, because the behaviors change all the time, and there's no way to predict. You know, the, the one thing we say, the only thing predictable about these animals is that they're unpredictable, so you never know what's gonna happen. There are so many animal cameras online. Just search live animal camera and see what you can find. If your parents complain you spend too much time staring at the internet, Invite them to take a look. They'll probably join you for hours. Lester? All right, Carrie, thanks so much for that. And finally, in our Inspiring Kids series, one 10-year-old from Virginia turned her love of coloring into a personal mission to make sure other kids feel included. Bellin Woodard was coloring in her Loudoun County classroom when she realized something was missing from the crayon box. 
Her third grade classmate asked for the skin color crayon, but there wasn't one that matched her own. And I heard my classmates call the peach crayon the skin color crayon, and yeah, I know that it is a skin color, but it's not the only one. And so I kind of felt confused. So she decided to do something. I'm the world's first crayon activist, and what an activist is to me is like someone who's active in making a change, and I call myself a crayon activist because I like to say I'm changing the world one crayon at a, at a time. Thanks to Bellin's creativity and drive, she and other kids now have more options. If I were to color myself right now, I would use skin color Sahara. Bellin created the More Than Peach Project, her own line of crayons that reflect multiracial skin tones. So in this pack I have skin color Denali, and then skin color Serengeti, skin color Andes. The 10 year old designed 12 colors. Each have different names with skin color in the title. So kids know that each one is the skin color crayon. And Crayola has since followed Bellin's lead, creating its Colors of the World box last year. The sixth graders More Than Peach line also includes colored pencils, sketchbooks, and clothing. She even has a book coming out next summer. I wanted to make an art supplies brand that let kids know that not only the peach or the brown, it's always skin color. There's all these different shades and and you just want to make sure that when you're coloring, you can see you and not someone else. Bellin hopes her message of inclusion inspires other kids. You can do anything you set your mind to. And if you have a problem, it's not just going to go away. You actually have to do something about it. And who knows, there could be more people who have that problem. And you're helping not only yourself, but helping others. And joining us now is Bellin Woodard. Bellin, thank you so much for joining us. And I have to tell you, I'm really, really proud of you and, and think it's fascinating what you've done. Thank you for having me. Yeah. What have the, what's the reaction been like from other kids so far? So I get about 500 letters a week and they're from mostly teachers and kids and some parents too. And they're saying, um, well, kids sometimes say, oh my gosh, Bella, you're my hero, or my mom um, just bought me your crayons, or um, teachers are saying, I just bought my students these crayons, and they're so excited, and they're all just really positive responses, and I'm so happy when I get them, because it lets me know that I'm on the right track, and I'm making a difference. You sure are, and so let me ask you what your message is to kids who are watching. My message is for kids who are watching are to is to well if there's if you see a problem do something about it because it's not just going to go away on its own and and there's probably not you're probably not the only person who is is experiencing that problem and I like to say there's no color in rule book which basically means that you can do anything you set your mind to do and do it your way, because there's no right or wrong way to do things. Well, it's a great message for kids, and it's really a great message for all of us. Bellin, it was so nice having you on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. We would love to hear from you. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Also, just a programming note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on NBCNews.com and YouTube. Thanks for watching, everybody. And remember, take care of yourself and each other. So long.